I frequently prefer instead to work in monochrome. I'd rather not have to grapple with the difficulty of choosing colors from among millions of possible options when I can instead confine myself to the elegant simplicity of a ramp that runs from white to black. It's liberating. It is also limiting. This ramp doesn't have a lot of what we might call bandwidth. But all that means is that we're forced to be creative in order to squeeze the most out of it. And that's something I love about monochrome, that challenge. And so that's what I'm going to talk about this afternoon, just a few of my assorted thoughts about how to get the most out of a limited palette. So let's make a map. Along the left, I'm going to keep a running indicator of how different portions of my monochrome palette are currently being utilized. And I can see right now that I have light gray land and I've got white water. And most of the rest I've marked as remaining bandwidth, meaning that these portions of the palette are still open to me for any additional map layers. So if I want to drop cities on here or roads or something like that, I could draw upon these darker shades to depict those things. I think it's valuable to think about limited palettes as a resource to be spent or saved as you go along. So my first piece of advice to you this afternoon is to try thinking about monochrome that way. You have this limited pool of resources that you need to sort of track and allocate carefully and efficiently as you build your map up layer by layer. And in the case of this map, uh, I feel like I could do with some more resources. I've barely just begun. I only have land and water on here, and yet I'm already down to only about two-thirds of my original palette remaining. I'd like to try and find a way to maybe free up some more bandwidth. And one way that I could do that would be to turn the land white. And from a palette perspective, that's great. Now that the land and the water are both white, I have a lot of options for any future map layers I want to drop on there. Almost you know, maybe 90% of the palette is still open to me. The downside is that any readers are probably going to have a pretty difficult time distinguishing the land from the water. So I've got to fix that somehow. And I can do that by giving the land an outer glow. And an outer glow is just a band that runs along the coastline and kind of fades off as you get out into the water. And it has a very powerful optical effect of kind of popping the land up out from the water and making them into two distinct entities even though, again, they're both still white, so I still have the advantage of all that extra space in my palette. Uh, and you can also see on the indicator that the glow itself does take up some of my palette room, but it does so in a way that's not exclusive. I could drop a polygon on this map that happens to take up one of the same shades as the glow, and there's no chance that someone's going to confuse those two things. We'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment, but it's perfectly fine to reuse portions of your palette as long as you, you know, symbolize them in a way that doesn't allow for any confusion for your readers. Now, if you don't happen to like the look of the outer glow, you might instead prefer water lines, as I do. I'm a big fan of those. And they're simply concentric buffers emanating outward from the land. The overall effect is pretty similar to the outer glow. It sort of creates the land and the water as two distinct entities, while still allowing them both to sh uh, share the same palette space, in this case, both be white. Uh, just because we can use white with water lines, though, doesn't mean we have to. They look fine if I want to go back and tint my land gray again. But the nice thing about the water lines is because of them, I can get away with a little bit lighter gray than I had at the start of this process. I have the advantage of still freeing up some bandwidth versus what I began with a few slides back. Uh, things like glows and coastal effects, they're very useful for separating land and water, but we can also apply this idea to other map layers. I could drop some arrows on top of this map and make them white and then give them a shadow. And a shadow is very much like an outer glow. It has a very similar optical effect of, of popping those arrows up from the background while still allowing them both to be white, which means that I am spared from having to spend another shade from my palette in order to distinguish these things from everything else around them. Glows and shadows and coastal effects, all of these things that kind of operate on the edges of the polygons to make them distinct, they're all very powerful tools. And my second piece of advice is to make good use of them because they let you get away with uh, using things that look very similar or the same and still creating visual distinctions between them. And we want to do that because of my third piece of advice, which is you should reuse portions of your palette whenever you can get away with it. So here I've got both water and arrows sharing the same portion of the palette. They're both white. Here's another map that makes a lot of reuse of the same shade. I've got various weather stations and some striped counties and a solid filled county along the left, and all of them are reusing 
the same middle gray from my palette so that I am spared from having to spend more resources on this map. I don't have to give each one of these counties its own separate shade. So we want to reuse things. And there's no real chance of an audience, you know, a, a reader confusing these things with each other because each one is symbolized differently and some of them are polygons as well and some of them are points. So reuse portions of your palette when you can get away with it. And that's a caveat because sometimes we can't. Uh, sometimes there's a potential for confusion. For example, if I had one of those weather stations that overlapped that one of those striped counties, then I probably would need to use some extra palette space to make a distinction there. But here, I have a geographic separation, so everything's fine. I can make good use of my palette. One thing that helps this work as well is my use of patterns, and that brings me to my fourth point, which is uh, patterns are your friends, but don't go crazy with them, right? It's very easy to overdo patterns in monochrome, and so I've got five of them on this map in this case, starting to get very chaotic and confused. The point of maps is to clarify what's going on, not force a reader to dig for it. So this thing could probably use some help. I would probably want to do maybe a couple of different shades and a couple of different patterns in combination to try and make this work a little bit more cleanly. Or I could just ditch the patterns altogether. And I could say, let's carry that information in the text. Map labels are often a better solution than map symbols in many cases. Uh, you know, text is often very clear. Finally, don't be afraid of using white. Uh, so often on our maps, we think of white as background, as absence of data, as nothingness. Uh, and it's fairly uncommon, it seems to me, to see it used to actually carry specific data layers, like counties and cities in this case. We already have such a limited palette to begin with. And so let's not limit ourselves even further by reducing it at the beginning and saying we're not going to use white for anything other than our background layer. Sometimes if you have a dark enough background, you can get away with carrying data in white. And you know, in Alex's presentation, there were some representations of roads and boundaries that also used white. It's good use for it. So that's five things. Think of your monochrome palette as a resource pool to make use of and that you need to sort of carefully track and shepherd through the process of building your map. Make good use of glows and shadows and coastal effects to create distinctions because you want to reuse portions of your palette whenever you can get away with it. And do use patterns, but don't go crazy. And then finally, make good use of white. Before I leave off, I have a couple of parting thoughts about monochrome in general. First off, uh, monochrome does not necessarily mean gray. If you think monochrome gray is boring, you could make red monochrome instead, or blue, or green, or whatever. All of the colors of the rainbow are open to you in monochrome. You just have to use them one at a time. <laughs> so, you know, take advantage of that. You know, go crazy. Also, because there are no hues to distinguish from each other in monochrome, that means a reader with a color vision impairment sees substantively the same thing as a reader with full color vision, meaning that monochrome is a good choice for accessibility. And in some ways, it's an egalitarian choice because it's one of the only times that those two groups are on equal footing when looking at a map. So that's kind of neat. Finally, monochrome is not just for print. Monochrome is for the screen, it is for print, monochrome is for the web, monochrome is for everyone and every map, potentially. Uh, you know, we often end up sort of adopting this mindset that color should be the default for our work. It is the assumed way that we will start with our map and we only turn to monochrome when we're forced to, when we have to print in black and white, for example. Uh, but it occurs to me more and more recently that that seems kind of backwards. Shouldn't color be the tool that we bring in to solve a specific problem, something that we wield with intent and thoughtfully to do a specific thing that needs to be done in a map? Uh, but instead, it's just sort of, you know, color is the thing that we have to have in our maps. And that leaves people like me sometimes sitting at my computer, staring at the screen, feeling like my color choices are arbitrary because they are, in fact, unnecessary in many cases. I would like us to be more intentional about our use of color. And so I have an example of something like that. I have a monochrome base map and a single color layer. And that layer pops to the front of the visual hierarchy. It feels important and wants our attention. Color is powerful on this map because color is limited on this map. And so I think that's a good model to start thinking about. And so if you're not ready to go full monochrome in your work just yet, 
think about ways to go partially monochrome and to use color in a more limited and therefore a more effective way. I'm a big fan of monochrome. I love working in monochrome and I think it offers an excellent test of a cartographer's design sensibilities and creativity. And I hope it's a challenge you'll be willing to take on in the coming months because I have a mind uh, at some point next year to launch a modest monochrome map competition of some sort on my blog. And so if you have no particular excuse up to this point to make something in monochrome, now you do. And I look forward to seeing what you come up with. Thank you. <laughs>